doesn't love a good James Bond thriller? I'm Gail Zergerman, host of the podcast Growing Older with Gusto. And today, our guest on the show, after spending over 50 years in the high tech business, decided they wanted to return to their passion. What is their passion? Their passion is spy movies. They did their research and they discovered that most sites are dedicated solely to James Bond movies. They kept exploring and found out by examining other spy movies that had been made that so many of them are interrelated. And their curiosity led them to discover things about the origins of spy movies, common themes, scenes that you see within different movies and the influence each spy movie has on others in this genre. So they started a podcast called Spy Movie Navigator. And this podcast is um, sort of designed, I guess, to enhance your viewing experience, if I get this right, when you watch different movies. So it was created as a landing pad for people interested in spy movies from the classics to current releases. There's so much to talk about today. So let's get started. Welcome to the show, Dan and Tom. Hey, We're Gail. very happy Fantastic. to be here. Fantastic yeah. to be here. Thanks for inviting oh, us. Sure. I'm Appreciate excited it. to talk to you and learn more about this passion of yours. First yeah. of all, tell the listeners, what ignited your passion for delving into the genre of spy movies? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first on that one. And uh, first of all, we have a, a website, spymovienavigator.com, and the podcast show is called Cracking the Code of Spy Movies, so your, your listeners could get that. Okay. And so... Uh, it went back to high school. I went to, uh, I was at St. Ignatius High School and my friends and I decided when Goldfinger came out that we were going to cut classes and go downtown, sneak downtown and go see Goldfinger. The, you know, it was the third James Bond movie ever out. And so uh, we, had a, we had a system in the class where the teachers took, took roll call. You know, and if your name, they put the names on a piece of paper and they clipped it outside the door, and then someone would come and pick it up. If your name was on the list, you were in the class. If it wasn't, you were absent. So, a friend of ours, our mission was uh, go downtown, see Goldfinger, and our inside guy was going to put our names on the lists for each of our classes, and everything was going to be great. So, we went downtown, saw Goldfinger. It was terrific. Went back to school the next day, and boom, we're in <laughs> detention. Like, what? <laughs> And our friend chickened out. Oh, God. <laughs> so we were in detention for about a week, but it was worth it. That's got me started on, on oh. the spy movies and, and wow. James Bond in particular. <laughs> wow. How about you? Yeah. yeah, for me, it was back in, in really for, spy movies and, and the Columbo TV show. Oh. You know, Columbo's not really a spy, but it kind of got me going on the genre of it. But then when I looked at things like The Spy Who Loved Me, which was my first Bond movie that I saw in the theater, it was kind of like, OK, this is different. I really like this type of movie. And so that helped me with that. And then why we started delving into them, other than just being fans, is that we got we were on a trip and we were up in Pete's Gloria, which is this mountaintop retreat that was used in the movie on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Wow. Yeah. And it's gorgeous up there. And it's just like this remote little thing on top of a mountain. And where is and it? Where is this located? It, it's in Switzerland. Uh, outside of 10,000 uh, feet up. <laughs> yeah, just above the town of Murren. Yes. And Dan and I were sitting in the bar that night. And we're like, we liked it so much. There's got to be other people who would like this. And so we started looking into, you know, can we do something around this? I was thinking at that time about retirement and looking for something to do. And we were like, can we do something here? And uh, six years later, here we are and having a heck of a good time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So, tell us about how the origins, well, what are the origins of spy movies? Like you mentioned Columbo. I, I would think of Columbo off the top of my head. Or Goldfinger, I think, was one of the first James Bond movies I saw also. Um, what were, what are the origins of spy movies as you did your exploration into this genre? What did you discover? I mean, really, when you look back on spy movies, everyone thinks of James Bond, of course, and, you know, Ian Fleming wrote all that, all the novels and stuff starting in 1953. But if you look back on spy movies, they've been around for decades before that. So you go back in history to spy movies, you, you look at the 1935 Alfred Hitchcock movie, The 39 Steps. Many people consider that to be the first official 
spy movie. There there were a few before that, actually. Actually, it was a silent movie, too, as well. I was going to ask about that, if there were any silent movies. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about one yeah, of those. I'll I think. Talk about yeah, that. It's one that I like better than Dan does. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but and there were like you said, there were a few others before that. Thirty Nine Steps, though, really was the birth of the more modern concept of what a spy movie is, and really a lot of the elements that we see now in spy movies, or from that point forward, came from the roots of these older spy movies, like the Thirty Nine Steps in nineteen thirty five, Secret Agent, which was also a Hitchcock movie directed movie in nineteen thirty six. And, and others like that. So those really began the real spy movie uh, genre back in the 30s. What, and what was the Doris Day movie where she sang K. Sera, Sera? Wouldn't that, would that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was... The Man uh, Who Knew Too Much. Yeah, The Man, the man, the man Who Knew Too Much. Too much. And I it know. was both a 1934 version and a 1956 version of that. She was in the 56 version of that. But Hitchcock did both of them. So there you go. Yeah, and I also think that influencing on spy movies, World War One and World War Two played a big role because a, a lot of the early spy movies were around spying on the your war enemy. Yeah, and so there was there's a lot of influence there. But the first spy movie that I know of is something called Spion, which was done. It's a German silent movie yeah. by Fritz Lang. So it being silent is kind of nice because they can put up American <laughs> or English. They can put up English subtitles there, which is kind of nice. Huh. What year and did that come out? That was a 1928 movie. Wow. And you can find it online on YouTube. Um, there's something, there's a, one, a version out there by Blu-ray Classic Studios. It's actually a pretty good print of it. There's some that are really, uh, really tough prints, but that one's a pretty good one. But we see many of the tropes used in that movie used in f in future movies even though yeah. this was a, a, sil a silent movie but then you have secret agent the 39 steps that dan talked about by the time you got to that the formula was kind of there and in terms of getting us into what a spy movie really should look like or well, what the industry thinks it should look like yeah and, and tom mentioned the, the spy spies and world war ii and the, and the world war as well there's just a movie coming out now, The Ministry of Gentlemanly Ungentlemanly. Warfare. Ungentlemanly, the, the oh. Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. And that is based on a real uh, World War II operation, Operation Postmaster. And that is just coming out next week. We already saw it on Saturday and we did our we released our podcast episode on it today, as a matter of fact. Yeah. That one comes out on Friday the 19th. So it's still happening. <laughs> yep. Yes. So when you first started, you know, getting together and getting your ideas together, how did you discover that certain spy movies or themes are interrelated? And, and what was your take on that? Why do you think that is? I think a couple of things, really. I mean, spies uh, like Ian Fleming, for instance, he was a naval, uh, a naval operations officer, internal intelligence officer for the British. So a naval intelligence officer. So he knew a lot of stuff that was going on. Matter of fact, he was involved in many of the operations that were executed in World War II. So the concept of what goes into real spying worked its way into the movies for sure, because mm -hmm. it's certainly because of Fleming and, and how he popularized spies. But it's the real world element, I think, that really influenced what went into spy movies. Yeah, absolutely. And and trains, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> trains. Well, every spy movie's got to have a train. The, the early spy movies all had train scenes, and now almost every spy, not all of them, but almost every spy movie has a train scene in it. Many with a fight on the train. Yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is pretty interesting. The greatest fight of all on the and train so, was from Russia with love. <laughs> so, you see something, so you see something like that, and it influences the next movie out. Yeah. So then other things like... There's a mole in the organization or the trope the Hitchcock called a MacGuffin where you have an object that people are going for. What it is doesn't really matter. Right. Right. But it's the fact that it's the mission of getting that whatever it is, that mm -hmm. MacGuffin. And yeah. that Hitchcock started that and everybody started using that. Well, it's another uh, tool that Hitchcock used. And I'm going to ask you, if you saw that in other spy movies, is he always appeared in every movie? <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, he did. It, yes. Did other people copy him or not? In other yes. spies, they did. 
Yep. You see yeah, a little the, bit here and there, but not as much as Hitchcock. I don't think. Yeah. The, well, the, the one of the, um, is, is he a producer owner? Well, I, Michael G. Wilson. He's Michael like, G. Wilson. Who's one, yeah, of he's the, one of the, he's one of the two guys that owns Neon Productions. And this is the James Bond movies. Yeah. And he's in, I don't, I don't know since he started working on him. I don't he's know one that he's not in. I think he's in all of them. He's not in he, all of the early ones, but he's in yeah. certainly the later ones. Yes. And since yeah. he started so, working. So he, he does that. He makes a little cameo. Yeah. So it has been done. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. Hitchcock I mean, though, when he, he did it, he, he started putting himself in earlier in the movies because people were so distracted looking for him that they weren't paying attention to the movie. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, and I think one other influence that I wanted to make sure I, I talked about here is real world spy stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. Real world espionage tasks, things like something called a brush pass, where you two people pass and they hand something off and you don't, it's so fast you don't even see it. Yeah. Or a dead drop where they put something somewhere, you know, a predetermined place and somebody else comes by later and picks it up. And so, as things change in the real espionage world, that some of that stuff ends up hitting into the real spy movies. So the real world espionage world is influencing what we see on screen. Absolutely. Yes. Do you think there's ebbs and flows to like the audience interest in this genre? Does it change according to world events? Like how important, like you mentioned, world events do play into their development of these spy movies. Does what's going on in the outside world have any impact on the interest in the genre? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. They, especially the Ian Productions people who produce the James Bond movies, they they are constantly looking at what's going on in the world for their movies because they're they're out of Fleming material, right? Fleming <laughs> wrote about thirteen novels and short story collections, so they're out of Fleming material for the most part. So they're always constantly looking at what's going on in the real world. What's the influence of that on the the global uh, perspective of country versus country and so on and spy versus spy. And so absolutely that makes a, a lot of sense for them to do. And people, of course, if they're familiar with it, they're, they're uh, going to be more interested in that. So it's smart business to do it, but it certainly is a good source of, uh, of information for them to do the screenplays and write new material. Yeah, but I also think the whole ebb and flow thing, too, comes into play with things like the Cold War. Right? Yeah. There were a ton of spy movies and they had to shift after the Cold War. And I'll put it in quotes ended. Right. <laughs> and so yeah, how yeah. espionage was done, you know, it, it's still all there, but it's not as big of a thing in the in people's minds as when we were very heavily involved in the Cold War. I think we're starting to, as the world events happen now, I met, I'm going to bet we're going to see more Russian and Asian spy, oh. you know, conflicts happening here. And that will be a bit, very big influence on the industry. Yep. Tom, that leads into my next question that just came top of mind is, are spy movies in different countries different than ones that originate in the United States? Or do they play off one another? Do they copy or do they, are there something that's, uh, common depending on which country they're produced in. Well, I, I think they're not a, being produced in certain countries. I don't know. Yeah, yeah well, we just did one on Razi, which was produced in India. At their, and again, the, I think you have a subset of um, of themes that are in spy movies, and it's oftentimes country versus country for one reason or another. And in this Indian movie, it was the uh, Indian Pakistani war during that time frame. So again, and they're they're going to frame it from their Indian perspective and what a spy organization looks like for India versus Britain or the United States or whatever. But that was a very interesting movie because now you're seeing their perspective of their battle basically with Pakistan. And they did a really fair job of 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 presenting both sides evenly, basically. Yeah. So yeah, they had it. So it's going to be different from each country, but it's going to be their perspective that brings it to, but brings it to the film. But it's going to be still this subset of, of tropes and standards and things that happen in the real spy world that are going to be used over and over again. Now, also with India, though, Dan, you get a very, there's a different formula in India for doing a movie. 
most of the movies that are over two hour long, two hours long, get an intermission. Wow. Um, and there are, if it's Bollywood based, there's a dance break <laughs> in the yeah. middle of the movie with a song. And even if you don't have the dance break, they've got musical interludes where they advance the story, but you don't without dialogue. It's just the whatever the lyrics to the song are. Yeah. Not the not the actors talking. So the style is different, but the concepts are going to be very often similar. I mean, if you take a look at like the Chinese movie Cliff Walkers from a few years ago, or you take, you know, um, Patan, which was another Indian movie, it's us versus them, whoever, whoever them is, whether it's a country or another organization. Yeah. And we've got to stop them from doing something bad. That's very, very common across all of the movies that I've seen across all the different nationalities. Interesting. Interesting. And in, in Razi, uh, when they were smoking, they put a, a flash up on the screen saying smoking kills. <laughs> 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 well, they do some things different. <laughs> yes. Interesting. What other influencers would you say play into the spy genre? World of I, I, I think you have a lot of things like we were talking about from the real world that that influence what goes in. But you also have spy movies that influence other spy movies. and. Those are the kinds of things that I think uh, we look at in all of the things we do. We always are looking at how this, this one we just did on the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. We looked at maybe four or five or six other movies that you can reference within that movie that you could say, oh, yeah, this kind of thing was going on in this movie or that movie and so on. So I think that's a big influence. What happens in one spy movie, if it's successful will you will see it over and over and over again like the train concept that tom was talking about uh over and over and over again in future spy movies so that that's a biggie and one example of, of things coming from the real world was uh, from the goldfinger movie in 1964 when james bond in the pre-title sequence comes out of the water in a wetsuit he's going to go in into this area and do the blow up some some stuff he needs to blow up He's in a wetsuit, but he unzips it and he's in a tuxedo so that he looks like he fits in to the to his atmosphere, right? And so you think this could never happen in the real world, and this is just fantasy stuff. But actually, it really did happen in the in the real world in World War II. There was a an operation in uh, the Netherlands where a specially made wetsuit was made for this diver. He was to go in and extract a couple of prisoners from this German mansion. And he was going to fit in because he had the tuxedo on and be able to walk right in and do this. So it actually really happened in real life. So, so that kind of stuff, constantly they're looking for. And Tom and I look for that in these movies and bring that out because a lot of people would not pay attention to that kind of thing. And so we're bringing these different elements out to the movies, but they're big influencers in what happens in yeah, and I think the times matter a lot, too. So, if, like, when we, we talked about the Cold War, but there's a lot of things. If you think about something like Star Wars, that wasn't a spy movie, but it had a very direct influence on the James Bond movie Moonraker. Hmm. Bond used to smoke cigarettes. He doesn't do that anymore. The womanizing has been brought way down. Yeah. And now the next thing we're seeing in spy movies is the topic of artificial intelligence. And uh, many people don't know what it means. So in the movies, they make it be anything they want and totally ridiculous. And I, I think it's going to be overplayed. Uh, we saw it in the last Mission Impossible movie, and it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I kind of understand that stuff a bit. Um, and then the other thing is you see influences on what was successful in another movie. Maybe not on a specific, oh, we were on a train and had a fight. But action sequences have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's like they keep trying to outdo the last movie with the with an action scene and stunts. It's raising the budgets to an almost unsustainable level. And so I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that calms down, because if you look at something like Ministry that we just talked about or Razi, there's not as much of those big action scenes in them. And but the industry was kind of like trying to one up each other for quite a while there with the stunts and that's not really, you know, mainly in spy movies. 
And that's not really about the espionage. That's just about how a spy movie is made. And that, that's what's going on now. And it's been going on for several decades, really, is the battle between espionage for spy movies we're talking about espionage and real espionage like happens in from russia with love versus action movies which Mm -hmm. many of the mission impossible movies are and so the producers are constantly looking at what's selling right and they're making those adjustments if action is selling their spy movie is more action oriented than espionage oriented so that's a constant battle and it and it changes over time and it changes from country to country really so it, it is a battle for the producers to try to figure out what to do next. But it has been a battle between those two elements, espionage and action, for decades. So they say timing is everything. And I know that the James Bond series has been on, constantly popular with every generation. I mean, let's talk a little bit about that and how... Um, is that sustainable? Or is there any other competition to James Bond? that has been as, as successful? Yeah, again, I, I think for James Bond, it's been around since 1962 for movies, 1953 when Ian Fleming started writing Casino Royale. And so it's been around for over 60 years. So is this sustainable? It looks like it. I mean, <laughs> they've done a good job so far. Uh, will, it, will it continue to be sustainable? Everyone's waiting to to see what their next decision is because Daniel Craig is no longer James Bond. That's been since 2019. That's been out and nothing's been done since. So people are wondering what's going to happen next. And so, yeah, it's it's a challenge, but I think they're going to continue to try to produce it. They do get new and more younger people interested. They must or else. The older people are not going to be around to watch the new movies, right? It's just so, interesting how all the different generations do enjoy it and and flock to those movies. Yeah. Well, if you, if to... you ask if you ask somebody who their favorite James Bond actor is, there you go. It's likely to be whoever they saw first yeah. in the role. Yeah. And part of that is, you know, I mentioned that these things change over time and adapt to time. So if they were putting out some of the womanizing stuff that happened in the early Bonds, they might not get the audiences to, in today. So their ability to adapt is extremely important. It's a must for the money. Yeah. For the, I mean, just now, to be successful. Yeah. Now, if you look at other series that have tried to take on Bond, you had Bourne, which was a, was a very good, probably first two movies, and then it kind of tapered off. You had Mission Impossible, which is still very, very strong. Although they're at a they're at a critical point now with Ethan Hunt and Tom Cruise Tom playing Cruise. Ethan Hunt. Now the nice thing about with Mission Impossible is the team members come and go, so they could easily say it's not Ethan Hunt. We've got a new head of whatever the team is. Yeah. With the Bond movies, it's harder for them to do that. They have to just say, okay, here's a new here's a new actor, and He's we're going on our merry way. <laughs> yeah, but Mission Impossible definitely is the franchise that has any chance of competing with the James Bond franchise. And you look at that by box office numbers, and they're the only ones who compete globally versus James Bond. James Bond is a global phenomenon, and so is Mission Impossible. Many of the other franchises that are trying, you know, they they even tried Harry Palmer in the mid-60s, and that was Lynn Dayton, based on Lynn Dayton books and so on. They did three of them, and that was the end of that. So it's very difficult to do but Mission Impossible probably is in the best position to challenge the Bond franchise. And there are a lot of, with streaming, there are a lot of companies trying. So Netflix yes. has put out a bunch of things that they've said, this is our answer to go after Bond, right? We want this to be a series like Bond. And so you had, I mean, so you had like the Kingsman and yes. now and well, then going we're forward. The gentleman in Moscow right now. Oh yeah. Very good. Um, Very yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so it's so these these series happens, but nothing stuck as well as Bond. So far, what? So far. Let me ask you this: how, how did your background in high tech play into, if in any way, to your passion in the spy genre? Did it have any influence, or or was that just something that was totally different for you when you wanted to pursue that? Well, I'll let Tom talk on that because he's back. His background's high tech. Mine's sales and marketing. <laughs> but, I, but I have a sales and marketing angle too. <laughs> yeah. So, so for me, I actually got hooked on bond 
in high school. Um, and I just started, you know, gentlemen. You know, yes. Um, running out of time. I'm sorry to say. Okay. Okay. Um, but just tell me quickly, how did this interest come after retirement and how has it helped you as you you're growing older with gusto, you're passionate about this and you have so many interesting things to talk about just quickly, like in one sentence, tell us how this interest has helped you after retirement. Yeah, everyone wants to retire, and when they get there, they're bored. And so I think before you retire, you need to know what you're going to do. If you're going to be traveling half the, half the year, great. You're going to write a book, great. Tom and I are doing this, and because it keeps your mind moving, it keeps yeah. your body moving, it keeps you thinking, and it keeps you moving forward, you have to have something to do after you retire. And this is a productive, entertaining thing. That's We're in the entertainment business, so we're trying to entertain people. Okay. Fun. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and for me, for me, all I would add with that is, you know, my wife gave me the guidance before I retired that I needed to have something specific to do. Yeah. Of course, she was right. And this ended up being a perfect opportunity for me. I get to keep my technical skills going a little bit with with what I do. And I enjoy doing the spy movie. So it gives me something to keep driving for. That's great. That's so, well, how can our listeners find you, find your podcast? We have a, a website, spymovienavigator.com. And our podcast show is called Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. And it's also a YouTube channel, same name. And we're in every major uh, podcast app, you know, Apple, Overcast, everything. Every one of them we're in. So you could just go to your podcast app, look for Cracking the Code of Spy Movies, and start listening. We appreciate it. Okay. So thank you, listeners. I'm sure you enjoyed this episode. Please share it with your friends. And remember to stay curious and stay connected.